Welcome to the Paranormal Spectrum on the Untold Radio Network. I am your host, Barnaby Jones, founder of Cryptids, Anomalies, and the Paranormal Society. We have a great show today. Austin Maynard is going to be with us here in just a minute. But before that, guys, if you are a fan of Cryptids, Anomalies, and the Paranormal Society and want to see our team in person, here's where you can find us. We are going to be in Rhinelander, Wisconsin, May 18th at the Hodag Heritage Festival. If you're into Bigfoot, uh, we are going to be doing a Bigfoot expedition hike that evening at 7 p.m. Tickets are available on our website. After that, guys, we head to the Marinette Menominee Bigfoot and Paranormal Convention, May 31st and June 1st. May 31st, we will be doing a Bigfoot expedition in Upper Michigan. Myself and Rich Daniels will be leading that, and Chad Lewis, Rich Daniels, myself, and Doug Hycheck will be speaking at the convention on June 1st. Tickets are available with WisconsinCaps.com. And then, guys, we head down to Chicago for the Chicago Paranormal Convention on June 8th. And then coming up in August, we will be at Squonkapalooza in Pennsylvania and CryptidCon in Lexington, Kentucky, as well as several other places around the state. Here is a whole list of libraries that I will be presenting at this summer and October coming up. So guys, I hope that you guys can come out and check that out because it's going to be a lot of fun. All right. And if you want to know how you can support all things here on the Untold Radio Network, here's how. Show your support for the Untold Radio Network family of shows and join in on the conversation by using super stickers and super chats on YouTube. Got a question you want answered? 
ask it live via a super chat and get real time responses from our shows, knowledgeable hosts and guests. Help keep the untold radio network shows running strong. We need your support. Send your super chats and stickers now. All right, guys, we are live today. I thank you very much for tuning in. Please remember, this is a brand new show on the network. We are only three episodes in. So if you guys want to help us grow here on the Untold Radio Network on the Paranormal Spectrum, make sure that you like and share this for all your friends out there to watch. It's a new time slot, so people may not know what it's out there. But guys, today my guest is Austin Maynard. He is the founder of the organization known as the Underground Paranormal Network, a network consisting of seven relatively unknown haunted locations, equipment developers, ghost box builders, and innovative researchers that are working to advance the field. He does a lot of promotional work for his sponsors, marketing, and building outside of the box experimental equipment. He has been experimenting with ITC since 2017, focusing on exploring new paths of communication using custom-built experimental audio-video communication devices. In addition to working with several researchers, builders, and developers to continue pushing the boundaries further and keep moving forward with his understanding. He currently serves as the official tech manager for the series Death Walker with Nick Grah, and he is responsible for the equipment and experiments that are used in each show. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Austin Maynard. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, man. Hey, I'm excited to have you here. Uh, I had the opportunity to have an amazing conversation with you a couple, mo- a couple months back at the uh, Glen Beulah uh, convention, and uh, I thought... You are one of the first people that I want to have on here, so I'm I'm super excited to have you here today. <laughs> I appreciate that, man. Yeah, I I remember that was a good conference, man. I I remember talking to a lot of people and meeting a whole bunch of new people, um, and actually I made several really good friends out there. So, um, yeah, man, it was great. And uh, again, I I appreciate you uh, thinking highly enough of me then to have me on now, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So. Paranormal Spectrum, I want to cover a lot of different things from UFOs to paranormal and and get into the science behind it. And uh, that is the reason why I have you on today, because, you know, after our conversation, we got into a lot of really cool science and how things work and stuff. And I think that this is something that uh, needs to be explored more. So in your bio, we talk about uh, your experimenting with ITC. Can we start out and just kind of explain what ITC is and what it means? Uh, ITC uh, stands for Instrumental Transcommunication, and essentially it's just using electronic devices to uh, try to communicate with what we perceive to be the other side. Um, And I mean, there's a ton of different forms of ITC. Uh, There's really, I mean, (laughs) it covers such a wide spectrum of uh, of methods and devices, like everything from uh, electronic voice phenomena (EVPs) um, to ghost boxes to um, uh, you know any kind of uh, speech generator type deal. Uh, Like, there's so many different things that you can use, and technically, even using like an ovulus or using like uh, anything that can generate words, all that is ITC. Although there are, I believe that there's different levels of ITC, like where, you know, there's some more simple stuff and then there's really, com- you know, really complex stuff. Um, it just depends on the each person and how deep they really want to get into it. Um, but uh, yeah, I focus mainly on ITC. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things that I love to do with it. I, I just experiment and I explore, man. It's just, it's my passion. Awesome. So what, what got you interested in it to begin with? Did you have an experience or what, what happened? Uh, you mean with ITC or the paranormal? Well, ITC, I guess, specifically. What, what got you interested in working with that? Uh, well, I'll be honest. I remember the exact time that I started to really like dive into it. And my first, I mean, I was always a 
you know, I, I, I was a paranormal investigator since 2015. Um, and I really hadn't like, uh, you know, done anything, you know, I was just like everybody else, you know, just an amateur, just going to places, whatever, not knowing much. Um, but then at some point I saw, um, there was a guy by the name of Andrew Openlander. Uh, he, Chicago spirit wave is what his, uh, brand was. And, uh, he used to build the Andes boxes. Um, and there was one in particular, the PRD 1000, it's, uh, like it's stainless steel. It's beautiful. Um, and, uh, ever since that, I saw that video, I was like, man, that that's what I want. Right. And so obviously I went through this phase of like, cause like it was 2017. So like, you know, that was when the portals were really starting to get big. The Steve Huff wonder box and the geo box and all that stuff really got big because of paranormal lockdown really. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I started playing around with the pedals and stuff, kind of realized that it wasn't the path that I wanted to go. Um, like I felt like, uh, there are better ways. Um, I guess I felt like, like the more I learned and the more I dove into it, I realized like the pedals are really, um, eliminating a lot of, uh, a lot of distortion or frequencies. But, and the problem is like, you know, cause like when you're, when musicians use a guitar pedal, right. Um, they're using it for a specific sound and to eliminate any interference. Well, in the paranormal field, what are we looking for? We're looking for interference. We're looking for that, that thing that, um, when there's not supposed to be any interference and then all of a sudden it appears and something, right? So, um, I decided to go against, uh, or go away from the pedals and I started looking really deep into the circuitry and looking into how some of these devices work. And um, it just really made me fascinated uh, using the voltage to sweep a transistor radio. Um, you know, like uh, it, it's, you know, Frank Sumption really was the, the grandfather of the ghost box. And uh, everybody kind of branched off from what he did. But um, like just seeing the, I guess, the innovation, the creativity involved in making these things work. I mean, it's just a fascinating process to see how ghost boxes came from here to there. And, um, really I wasn't even going to build, like, I wasn't even a builder at first. Like I didn't even start building until uh, 2021. And, um, and that, the only reason I started building was because my, you know, my best friends in the field are like, you know, Stephen Katie Hall, KD Stafford, JW Prather. Um, you know, I'm real good friends with a lot of these builders. And so eventually they got so sick of me asking them to do things. <laughs> They're like, dude, you know what? You understand a lot of this stuff to a certain level. And so um, KD actually, I mean, you got, you know, KD, right? KD Stafford. He was, yeah, the shows. Uh, he um, decided that he was going to buy me my first soldering station and my first multimeter. <laughs> like this dude spent like 150 bucks just to get me off of his ass to <laughs> to go build your own stuff, man. I'm like, oh, fine. So then Steve Halte taught me how to, uh, how to put together his sweep circuit. And I mean, it's kind of like, that's a secret and I'm not, uh, I don't use it anymore. Um, I've done a few tributes with his sweep circuit in there, but I make sure that he gets the credit for it. Um, but I started following my own path. I got my own sweep circuit. Um, and I've started figuring out a lot of things, of course, with help from Steve, Katie, KD, and JW. Um, and, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm like, a, a, I consider myself to be like a protege of all of those guys. Like, they just kind of like, like all, a lot of the knowledge that they have told, given me, I've just kind of used it and stored it and made it into my own style. And so, like, everything that I build has their fingerprints on it. You know what I mean? And uh, I just keep finding more and more fascinating things about it, man. And uh, it's so hard for me to just say, like, nah, nah, there's nothing here. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Very cool. Very cool. Mm -hmm. So what is the what is the principle behind, you know, like the ghost box and the Frank's box and stuff like that? We, we all kind of use them in the field. You know, anybody that's done paranormal, I'm sure, has used one at one point. Um, mm -hmm. So why 
why do we think that instead of just hearing a radio come through, why do people think that there's a, a spirit able to communicate that way? Well, I think the whole um, the whole idea behind a ghost box in general was to provide sweeping white noise. Like, and basically, because you're wanting to sweep the different frequencies at a fast rate to eliminate, um, I guess the way that they first started doing ghost boxes was um, it was a manual sweep. Basically, you had the knob on the radio and you would turn it left and then you turn it right and just kind of go back and forth like that. And a lot of people thought that, you know, this was good because you as the user are controlling it and able to, you know, make it as fast or slow as you want. Right. And there's that uh, the energy transfer, I guess. Uh, but. Frank Sumption was the one that kind of decided, no, I don't want to do that anymore. So I'm going to find a way to take one of these old car radio tuners and I'm going to make it sweet by itself. And so what he figured out was that if you connect a function generator or a, you know, a waveform generator to it that produces a voltage, uh, it, it creates a, you know, a triangle or a sine wave, whatever, if you remember science class, um, and uh, basically, you put that to the, the tuner, and it will tune the radio, make the radio go up to the top end and down, you know, up and down, up and down. And so he, I mean, I have number 42. I have Frank's box number 42. And although it doesn't work anymore, because like, I mean, 2008, it was one of his like first 50 or whatever, <laughs> you know, he was still learning a lot. Um, but you look at the circuit inside of it, man, and you look at the radio that he used and it's like, how the hell <laughs> you have no idea what he's even doing in there? Because Frank was the kind of guy that if he put a part in it, even if the part wasn't like, um, even if it didn't work with the circuit, like he wouldn't take it out. He would just disconnect it from the rest of the circuit and leave it in there. And so like now he's his circuits are a mess and nobody can really like figure out when you look at the circuit, nobody can really figure out like what the hell is he doing? Because there's just so many random parts that are in there that aren't even connected. <laughs> They're just in there. But he was very adamant about um, it was meant to go in there. Even if it was even if it wasn't supposed to connect to the circuit, it was meant I, I was meant to put that in there for a reason. Um, but yeah, and so like it kind of just developed from that. Uh, from Frank Sumption, you know, he taught some other people, you know, he taught Steve Halte, he taught um, Joe Chiappi, he taught uh, Rich Georgina, he taught, um, I mean, so many people, just so many people that uh, Andre Wooler, I know is another one. Um, but like that kind of just developed into this thing. But I think that the whole idea behind it was allowing for sweeping frequencies, because even a radio channel, I mean, and I know that the term frequency is kind of a generic term for a lot of people, but radio frequencies have different wavelengths, just like anything else. Um, and so, you know, going from 108 uh, megahertz on FM or whatever down to 78 hertz or no, what would it be? 87, I think is a low, um, whatever, you know, like going from that, I mean, that's a big difference in the frequency with wavelength. Um, and so we think that if you go back and forth, you're basically providing a range of frequencies for them to be able to use. And we don't necessarily know because there's a bunch of different ways that you can look at it. A lot of people will use a ghost box and look for one or two word answers that come through, right? Um, but a lot of what more deeper ITC users look for is, uh, you know, use a very fast sweep. So like that shit is going, you know, like I guess the SB seven, right. As a minimum, like a fastest speed of like a hundred milliseconds, like let's cut that in half and sweep it analog style. So it's smoother. Um, because that's the difference between like the SB seven is more of a spirit box. It's a digitally coded forward and backwards spirit box. Um, but it doesn't really matter which direction you go. It'll sound the same. Um, but with uh, this, well, actually, no, because the SB7 would be a, a sawtooth, technically. It'd go to the top and then drop down the bottom, go to the top, start at the bottom. So, um, or vice versa, whatever. But uh, with 
the ability for the radio to go up and down, up and down, just like back and forth and continuously keep a smooth sweep. Um, we've noticed that throughout the band, you're going to have a whole bunch of radio stations coming through regardless. Um, but if you have that sweep speed fast enough, all you're going to hear is just little bits and pieces of words. You know, like as it goes through, it'll, you know, you're not going to make out what it's saying. However, there had been times like what really sold me into it was uh, especially what sold me on a specific box, the RCA uh, Steve's box. Um, when I had that fast, that sweep up fast. And I mean, it, the FM, I was hearing an accent come through covering the entire band on FM. Like, I mean, it would go up, down, up, down, and you would hear a full freaking sentence, like, in an accent. And I mean, like, it would talk for 11 minutes, I think, at that one session. I mean, I have it all on video. It was live. And I didn't even change any of the audio. I just went through and started captioning it. And it's like, holy shit, man, this thing was, like, talking away. Um, so, But I think that we, we don't really know if they're using the bits and pieces of speech or if they're actually imprinting their their voice onto um, into the radio frequencies and that's something that we look at with like jw's devices which would be uh like his direct links the uh, the i don't know did you buy one from me when, when we were there the fxwc or the no um no, well basically those um those direct links are all about uh Especially when you get one with Echo and Reverb, it's all about looking for direct applied voice is what direct applied voice is what JW calls it. And basically it's because they are um, like there's steps along the way. Like circuitry doesn't skip steps, right? It doesn't jump over one circuit or another. Um, like anything that comes from a tuner has to go through the echo and reverb board, through the amplifier, out the speaker. It's just one straight path. But when we, so everything coming out of there should have echo and reverb effects. But what happens when we get a voice that doesn't, or we get two voices that don't? How does that happen? And those are things that we're like looking for because like it does not make sense. And you could use the argument of like, um, you know, maybe the, the signal coming through wasn't strong enough. And it's like, but there are even voices that are quiet as shit that I hear repeat at least once. But then there's this one or two voices that will come through, one or two words that don't repeat. And it doesn't happen all the time. It's just every now and then. And so those, I think, like, that's something imprinting its voice into the radio frequencies. Now, I mean, what that is exactly, I don't know. We don't know. Like, But those are some of the fascinating things that, you know, really can be looked at with ITC is finding out where the manipulation is happening, how the manipulation is happening. Um, and relevancy, of course, is like, you know, I guess with ITC users, a lot of times relevancy can be a big part of it or a small part of it. For me, it's kind of like it's maybe like a third of it. But I think like it's more impressive to me when I find um, like there's been some actual manipulation. Like we are seeing true manipulation of of these radio frequencies without you know what i mean like something had to have put its voice in there after the echo and reverb board like it, it, there's no <laughs> like it's just so like what how you know and so like those are the things that just drive me and i think that that's what makes itc just so freaking fascinating man is because we don't know how these things are doing it but we're finding these anomalies interesting so do you think that these are when we talk about like frequencies and that stuff, do you think that these are like paranormal spirits or are they more of like interdimensional, like higher beings? Because we talk about like things like that operating on different frequency levels and being able to come through, you know, your portals and such. So do you think that what you're actually getting for the most part is, uh, you know, people's loved ones or spirits of, of deceased people, or is it something completely different? Well, that's a <laughs> that's a million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> One of them. That's um, not what we're here for. <laughs> man, see, no, like that's that's something that you know. I don't know if we're gonna figure out anytime, at least right now. Um, 
I mean, some of the things that people are working on are working to, I mean, it's hard to say that they're even working to try to figure it out because one, we still have to prove that we know what it is and we have to prove that we're actually getting something and it's not just like, I mean, proof to the scientific community of some sort, that there is some sort of form of anomaly that's happening that seems to have some intelligence. But um, I think that it, I don't know, man, because I think that there are, I mean, I want to almost say like fourth dimension type deal, but um, because like when the fourth dimension, if something were to come into, like I was actually listening to something about this last night and it really fascinated me. Um, if something in the fourth dimension were to somehow come into our third dimension, we, even if it's like, I know that there's that shape, I can't remember what the heck they call it, the one from the fourth dimension that we can't even perceive, right? Mm -hmm. um, if uh, it's something cube, it's like a cube of some sort, mm -hmm. but if that cube were to come from the fourth dimension into the third dimension, it would just show up like a cube and then disappear really quick. But we would only be able to perceive it as a cube because that's our three dimensional view. We can't perceive the fourth dimension, but the fourth dimension can perceive us, the second dimension and the first dimension. So I, I don't know if it would be in the same sense as that. I do believe that um, this is a realm that is parallel to ours, but I see like, I'm really big into like uh, looking into the dark matter. Like, I believe that, well, okay, you don't, if, for those who don't know what dark matter is, and we will get into the dark matter is literally what is just for lack of a better term that scientists and astronomers will use for all of the nothingness that is there, but we can detect it's like out in space, right? Everything that fills the void, everything in between all of us is what we would consider to be dark matter and dark matter is just the term for uh, matter that does not interact with photons and so we cannot see it or anything like the only reason that our what we can perceive to be reality is because the matter on this like the matter interacts with photons and so we work off of photons like photons is all that information so um if it doesn't interact with photons, does that mean that it's not there? I don't think so. I think that just because it doesn't interact with photons, I mean, the universe is so vast, we don't know what the hell's there. But all the space between me and this phone right here is filled with darker. It's also filled with other particles that are, you know, air particles, right? But dark matter is just such a, a, a I mean, like it's there, it's all around us. It's like in our realm of existence. It's just, it does not pick up on photons i mean i think it's more or less that i i don't know if it would be interdimensional in the same in the same definition that you, you know when you talk about first second third fourth stuff but i think that maybe more of a parallel realm of existence like within our realm of existence it just is like the opposite of because if we are photons and they would not be you know what i mean so i don't know I don't know. I think there's something, though. I don't know if it would be the dead person, though. You know what I mean? I feel like it's just some kind of other entity. Um, I mean, maybe there are dead people as well, but um, I don't know, man. I don't know. That's the million-dollar question. <laughs> Absolutely. We are going to take a really quick break here for station identification, and we will be right back. Hey, Untold okay. Radio Network fans. Want exclusive perks and to support our channel? Introducing our YouTube membership program with three amazing levels. Get loyalty badges that level up to different cryptids the longer you're a supporter. How cool is that? You'll also get access to custom Bigfoot emojis and priority in chat. Upgrade to Backstage Pass for exclusive wallpapers, photos, status updates, discounted books, and merchandise. Go all in with the producer level for everything mentioned plus member shoutouts. Ready for an enhanced experience? Join now, pick your membership level, and let's make this journey even more exciting together. 
All right, we are back live here on the Untold Radio Network. We are talking with Austin Maynard, who has spent a long time working with ITC and uh, experimenting with all things paranormal and ghosts. If you guys have any questions, throw them in the comments section, and uh, we will get them to you. We got a couple people listening, a lot of good comments, a lot of good mornings over here. Thank you guys for tuning in. Um so when we're talking about uh, the dark matter and these particles and stuff, so we talked about the voice phenomenon, the the ghost boxes and the spirit boxes and stuff like that. So yeah. if these these particles um, exist, uh, can we do uh, the same way that you're doing with the audio and the the frequencies over there? Can we make a device that would allow us to take a picture or a video in the same alternating frequencies that we're using with the audio? Does that make sense? Yeah. I think that, I mean, I believe that the only way that we would be able to even look, I mean, you're talking about getting into like quantum cameras. Like I think quantum cameras will definitely have a um, a big impact on us being able to see because when you talk about quantum cameras, you know, they're looking at everything from a particle level. Like it is taking pictures of all the particles in a specific thing. Like you take a picture of a rock and it will show the rock at like all the freaking particles. It'll just show us a big cloud of whatever, right? Um, but I don't know. And again, this is where it gets hard because all of those particles and the atoms that the quantum camera would be detecting are still only ones that pick up that, that interact with photons. And so we would still be kind of looking, we'd still kind of be in the same scenario. However, I think that we, first of all, we would have to be able to figure out what, how to figure out what dark matter is. Um, you know, because I mean, just because dark, it could be all kinds of different matter, you know, like all kinds of different things. It's just, we're just calling it dark all as a general whole of dark matter. But, mm -hmm. um, I mean, the only reason that we can even detect that we know dark matter is there is because of its gravitational effects. You know, it, it seems to, uh, warp light in the vacuum of space. And so something must be there in order for the light to be warped as a lens, in a sense. And gravity doesn't just, you know, like gravity is all around us. It doesn't warp our light. So, like, how is it warping this light? There's got to be something there, right? So, um, I guess that's, you know, we, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to be able to, at least in our lifetime, be able to create a device that would... Um, I mean, I know that it didn't just like CERN or not CERN, but um, there's some place over in like Sweden or over in the UK that just it was able to detect a gravitational wave for the first time. I don't remember. I mean, not off the top of my head, at least, but I know that they were. Well, CERN is that particle accelerator. Um, but I don't know. But regardless, like, yeah, they were able to detect. I mean, maybe it was actually because I know they do more than that. But regardless, so, yeah, so they detected is, uh, a great for the God particle or the Higgs boson. Oh, they already found the Higgs boson. They already got right. that. But it's uh, but now we're looking beyond that. I mean, that was like that was like how long ago was that? Like a decade? Which seems like crazy because like a decade has just fine fucking flown by. <laughs> it's like, god damn, what was a decade ago? 2014? Wow. Um, but the gravitational wave we were just able to somehow detect i don't know how but they detected it and i think that that's a good first step in figuring out where we need to go um but i still think i don't know i mean i like even michio kaku you know the the one of the uh the physicists yes the, the uh, physicists uh i mean he's one of the super smart ones uh talking about um you know, like we're not even a type one civilization. Like we can't even harness, harness the power of our planet. Um, and so I don't even, I think that we would have to even be like a type one or a type two civilization to where we're going to be able to like build a device that would somehow be able to get into that 
like what the dark matter is. I, I think we got a long way to go before we actually figure out where we're going with it. <laughs> like how to even detect it. Like what is it? How do we detect it? Maybe if you somehow came up with like a, like what's the opposite of a photon? I mean, there's, a, I mean, I know there's matter, like, cause it's, there's a light part of light and then there's a, the absence of light. Like, there's only two things, but like, what makes up the absence of light? Man, like, this is kind of like crazy stuff. So, you know what I mean? This is really getting deep and deep and stuff. And it's like, I don't even know how, how we would be able to get to that point, at least in our lifetimes. I don't think we're anywhere near we need near where we need to be. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> awesome. That's a, that's a long, I don't know answer. I love it. <laughs> so when, when we're talking about other things, you know, like some of the other tech that's out there, um, Mm -hmm. and, and some of it's for primarily ghost hunting, you know, like the, the SLS cameras, everyone uses those. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. then we have um, LIDAR, which is kind of pretty much what um, the SLS is based on for the most part, right? Yeah, it's, it's a, it is LIDAR technically, but it's not really like a very advanced form of it. It's what like, you know, the Xbox 360 or Microsoft used to just do, it's just to detect body movement and stuff like that, just for the game. It's not meant like to do mapping or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So when we have those different things, you know, a lot of people take them out in the field and use them for, for paranormal use and stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, uh, well, what are your thoughts on those? Do you think that they uh, have the capabilities to actually detect something like that? Or, you know, is it just uh, something somebody saw on TV and, and ran with it? Well, I think, well, I mean, obviously, like, you know, Bill Chappell was the one that kind of put that idea together before it even got on TV. You know, he had the SLS built before Ghost Adventures started using it. So, um, I, I mean, I don't know. I think that there's a lot of flaws with it, of course, but there's flaws with every software. Um, I don't think that uh, we need to necessarily be looking... You see, it's hard because I don't think that the light, again, it's the photons that you're just using IR lasers to do that. And I mean, I think that those basic SLS cameras, no, I think they're, you know, they're fun, I guess, for the, for ghost hunters. But as far as like actual evidence, no, but there is that the true XLS camera and not, and that doesn't mean the, the fucking V2 the version two of the uh what the xbox connect camera or whatever it's like the higher not the 360 but the next one up right what is that the i can't remember it's the second version of it but i don't i mean the second version of it is just an upgraded version of the 360 it's not really it, so the true xls i personally believe was built by a guy by the name of jeff conkel and he's the um he's the tech manager for ghost adventures um and he's he's pretty good man i mean he built the lidar the one with the 360 lidar uh rotating device and so i built one of those too uh just but the lidar it's almost like looking at it from a bird's eye view the screen and you can like see as you turn it's like mapping out the edges of the room right but what jeff conkle did was combined the the lidar 360 lidar scanner with the uh version two of the connect mapping camera and but and he knows how to work some of that software so he did a great job with that um into creating the true version of the xls now uh so like i love that idea i think that lidar would be really really um helpful although I think that the best way, if you're going to use LiDAR, the best way to do it would be to like set it on a tripod in the middle of a room and just like have it continuously mapping, kind of like the underground cave uh, mapping gun that they use uh, to like literally 3D map the entire cave um, or even like how they use it for uh, like overhead, like when they fly a plane over the jungles, um, like that kind of LiDAR uh, where it's actually mapping um, and there's no 
you know, there's no grid. There's no like, I mean, that it's there, but it's, I don't know. It's very basic. It's not a 2D image. It's like an actual 3D image that you can rotate. You see it. Um, I think those would be interesting because then it would continuously update a, a picture of a room if you were able to do it like that and you could detect if there was something that a random mass of something that came into the room um that would be interesting but i don't like the the sls versions as they are i don't like the uh, idea of walking around with it in your hand it's there's a lot of things that you know like a water heater or a refrigerator the side of a wall around a door frame you're always going to get two figures standing right there right I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's just me. That's just me. I, I completely agree with you. I think the, the SLS camera has a, a time and a place that it can be used, but you see people walking around with them and stuff, and they, they first of all, were not meant to be walked around with, you know, when they were designed. So you're you're getting all these false positives that you're, you're getting. If you're going to use yep. it at all, it needs to be a stationary you know, like you said, stationary in one spot to monitor a certain area. And then, you know, yeah. maybe something will come through, but. Yeah, no. because as you walk around with it, it's like it, it will continuously refresh and try to be detecting anything. And yeah, if you have it in one stationary spot, it will it, it will map out its room and then you can see if something else is mapped out out of nowhere. But every time you move, it like refreshes that that detection it has to refresh the image so like yeah there's gonna be a lot of random anomalies absolutely uh we got a comment question here anything new with krillian photography Ooh, i know what she's talking about um not that i've seen at least i mean i've i've looked into it for the show um because i know that i mean i was you know, I'm looking at everything, trying to figure out what what can we do, what new experiments can we do. Um, and I looked into it, but I think that it's a lot of uh, there's a lot of flaws to it. I think um, I think what you know it, what would be really people who don't know. Well, if I, if my understanding is correct, it's kind of like um, it's isn't it like with the aura, like the aura cameras, or it has like some kind of kaleidoscope image inside of it. Or lens. I don't. I don't really know exactly. I can't remember, but I know it's something like where it's like a distorted image, or um, like I, I know that there's something like I. I likened it to uh, taking a picture through a kaleidoscope, almost. Um, but maybe I, I. I may be off on that, and if I am, correct me. She might have to remind me what it is. But I know I've. I've looked into Carillion photography before. Um, I know. I, I, I if I, if nothing new has happened, it's probably because I looked at it, and or I mean, let me see, so let me rephrase. Let me rephrase it. I haven't seen if there's anything new with Carillion photography because I know I looked at it a while back. I didn't. I didn't think that there was a whole lot that could be done with it, so I moved on. However, speaking of uh, doing that. I've been looking at possibly how can we uh, do like microwave photography or like because uh, the x-ray you need radiation microwave you don't like microwave you can just see through all the walls you get like it'll um, show you you know uh, what's that what's that uh, fucking was it Iron Man or no 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 it's Batman the Dark Knight right where he has like the, the it connects to all the cell phones and like it'll like show the entire freaking right you remember is that is that what i'm talking about I've never um, seen it. <laughs> no you've never seen it oh yeah <laughs> um but basically yeah the technology is like it can connect it'll ping out all cell phones and each cell phone will like do like almost like a sonar and so like he can see throughout all the walls everything and he can see where cell phones are at and he can see the shapes of everything to know where he's at and he, so even in the dark even in pitch black he can see where he's going um and it's kind of using like a echolocation like a bat would right um i think that would be really cool i think you know looking within the frequencies and using frequencies as cameras or using um using these radio frequencies to map out an image and uh i mean there's ways to do that and i've been 
I'm really looking into it, but I don't know how I'm very bad with, uh, actually, I'll be honest. I don't have any idea what I'm doing when it comes to writing software or creating, you know, anything like that. But, uh, I think I'm definitely interested in looking into different photography, not just Karelian photography, but all kinds of other stuff. Courtney uh, would like to know, uh, a lot of people actually think that's how Wi-Fi works in our homes. They use it like a microwave camera. I mean, even if that, I mean, yeah. I mean, I know that I, I get what she's saying, but I also believe that uh, if they're using it as a microwave camera, if they are using it, especially like, I know people are worried about being spied on and stuff, but like a microwave camera is not going to, I mean, all you're going to see is like, you know, it's going to ping off the image of your TV, but it's not going to show what's on the TV. It'll just show that it's in the room. It'll show that your couch is there, maybe. So I guess you could see what the room looks like and complete just the shapes. But I don't I don't think that it would actually see anything. <laughs> Unless you were caught in an awkward, you know, a compromising position in the bedroom <laughs> and it's so obvious. And then you had your router right there. <laughs> I guess I'd get an image back of you, you know, doing what you're doing your business, but. <laughs> <clears throat> so I think back at the convention, we had a discussion about um, in instead of using radios to use like the old uh, television sets where you could tune them by the knob. Now, uh, I'm, I'm super curious to see. Uh, I know you had uh, one device that was kind of like that there at the time. Have you done any work with that? And uh, do you think that it's possible to scan through the television frequencies the same way that we would with a, uh, a spirit box or a ghost box and get a, a visual image? You know, it is so funny that you say that. Because guess what I have sitting right here on my bench that I'm working on? I know you seen me soldering earlier, right? <laughs> I'm going to show you now. Because now I just uh, attached my sweep circuit to it. And now uh, I'm going to show you. I'm going to turn it on. And y'all are going to see the sweep of the TV frequencies. I just gotta watch it because this freaking thing has like a crazy high voltage and I will get my ass electrocuted if I put my finger on certain areas on this circuit. It's really weird because like you could put 12 volts into it and somehow that like certain parts of it will end up having like 46 or 50 volts. It's like, holy shit. How does it jump from 12 to 50? All right, well, well, I just had to plug it in. I'm just going to push it in here like that. All right. I, I, don't, I have the speaker unplugged. So it may be a little difficult to, uh, you won't be able to hear anything, but uh, now. I have my sweep trigger here. I'm gonna, I turned down the sweep speed. Like you see, it's just up. Yeah. Now watch as I increase the speed. But now, so basically right now what I'm doing, I'm sweeping on uh, UHF. But I can also, I can adjust the tuning dial and I can have it sweep different sections of the band because I mean the the way these TVs work, man, the, like the tuner this is what I was talking about. Like the tuner will go up to like 30 volts and I don't have a sweep circuit. I mean, I would have to put a lot of freaking power into that. So that's what Frank Sumption used to do is add like 24 volts onto a sweep circuit to sweep a TV. So he's like using like two car batteries <laughs> <laughs> you know, like doing uh, two lawnmower batteries or whatever. Um, but uh, with this, yeah, I mean, I can only sweep about five volts of it, five or six volts of it. Um, but, I mean, you can see, yes, I can do it on UHF. Uh, where's the, the 
this one. That's a uh, uh, VL or VLF, which a lot of people believe that is more uh, attuned to uh, spirit communication, or they look at it as VLF, and this is UHF, and it's just yeah. I mean, I love the idea of it. I've gotten some crazy pictures. Um, I mean, I don't know if I showed you that image that I took uh, when I when we were at the con. Did I show you the picture that I took of the TV on the TV screen of the face? I even got that word right, the word "high," just like way in the tiny little thing in there. I don't know. I mean, that one was kind of. I mean, you could take it for what it's worth—the pixelation, being weird, whatever. But it's interesting. It's all interesting. But when I have Especially, the sound on, there's even times where I've heard voices come through. I've heard of me and my partner, Eric, actually, we're sitting right here. We were working on a TV, and we heard a voice come through on the VHF station, on the VHF band. But I guess it is funny, I guess, that sometimes the VHF, you you might occasionally pick up a broadcast, but it's not it's rare, apparently, so. I was gonna say we don't usually use the um, the analog frequencies anymore mm -hmm. for television. It's all digital, so that there's pretty much should be nothing coming through on there. So yeah, um, there shouldn't be. But Lee said, Lee said that sh uh, please don't <laughs> electrocute yourself on air, and uh, she said though it may make this the most watched episode on YouTube. <laughs> well, I turned it off, so I don't. Uh, I'm good. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Courtney would like to know uh, VHS being the high frequencies. Well, VHF is what very high frequencies. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if that's uh, if that's exactly what it stands for. I'm not. <laughs> I, I, it might be very high frequencies, but then UHF could be ultra high frequencies. But then what's the uh, very low frequency? You know, I don't know. That's a good question. But although the VLF is is very low frequency, is a, that's actually what it's called. So mm -hmm. it might be very high frequency. I guess I would have to double check that. I know I've read it before, but and you would think that I would know that. <laughs> but I know, I do know that the VHF and the VU and the UHF frequencies and maybe even the VL actually fall along the uh, FM spectrum or the fm band like there's smack dab in the lower like there's fm or well i'll do it this orientation so fm and then there's like the vhf uhf and there's shortwave in there too and then there's a little bit more fm right here it's really weird no wait wait, wait. yeah yeah no no i'm right i'm right i know that you vhf and uhf definitely are right along the right within the fm band there's like you know there's fm on both sides of those two things so they're they're in that range i guess i don't know uh but now yeah like you said that we can't even do it you have to have an analog to digital you have to have a digital to analog a digital to analog converter. no it'd be an analog to digital converter so that you can uh to get that uh signal but you'd have to have the right antenna too so but yeah, we can't. I couldn't just turn dial this in and just tune it. And like, I guess maybe I could. I don't know. I'd have to figure it out. I'd, I'd have to play around with that idea if I could take one of these old, like super old tube TVs, right? Because I don't know. Can you even? I don't know. I'm gonna have. I'm gonna play around with it. <laughs> Sorry, I work things out in my head a lot. Like I'll just like work it out in my head because I get with the idea and I'm like. Damn, I want to run with that a little bit. Let me think about that. <laughs> That's how I get ideas. Uh, I think Lee looked it up here for us. Lee uh, says VH is very high and UH is ultra high. And then Boom, I knew it. V, VH is uh, 156 to 174. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. That's, uh, that's correct, but... Um, yeah, yeah, UHF, UHF and VHF and actually forest coverage. Yeah, UHF uh, and VHF, or yeah, UHF definitely can. Um, they can use that for all kinds of things. Um, 
but I don't. I I know that the military still uses them on specific frequencies to um, for communications because they and part of part of that obviously is because they discontinued the broadcasts on the VHF and UHF frequencies for TVs or anything, so you can't typically get anything on there anymore. So they use it specifically for those on certain frequencies but um yeah thank you for that information so yeah vhf is line of sight that's right mm -hmm. mm -hmm. kind of like am it's weird here's another interesting point i don't know how much you look into like uh the bigfoot and uh that kind of stuff uh the using oh, yeah. the frequencies and stuff to search for animals and lost people i know in um the past seasons of Expedition Bigfoot, they use this military mm -hmm. um, frequency detector to try and pinpoint the actual frequencies of specific animals in an area. So if we can mm -hmm. do that with different, you know, if, if each different life form vibrates at a certain frequency, we should be able to, to map that as well for uh, things that aren't animal or mineral, possibly. I mean, technically we could happen like that's the whole thing is like we could see anything if we can like find a way to tap into that specific frequency um like i mean that's why i can see you you can see me but we all we each vibrate at our own different frequency but i, I mean yeah if we can tap if we could have a camera or some kind of visual thing but like even she was saying uh the UHF, they can penetrate that deep forest coverage so like they can look with uh they could look for Bigfoot that way. They could do it a lot. Like, that's actually kind of where I wanted to go with uh, some of this stuff. But, um, I mean, yeah, it is definitely possible to, you can tap it, like, uh, even with audio or video. Or, like, if you were able to change your frequency level, like, it's possible that, um, okay, so let me put it, give you an example that I heard the other day, right? The reason that, I can't pass my hand through a table is because there is a repelling between the molecules and the table. There's a repellent between the frequency of the table and the frequency of my hand. But if my hand, I were to find a way to bring my hand down to the frequency of the table, I'd be able to pass right through it because there'd be no resistance between the particles and the frequency, you know? So yeah, absolutely. 100% we could do that. It's just, I just don't know if we have the, if we're in the right, we don't have the technology yet, I guess is what I'm saying. Have you, uh, kind of on topic, but off, um, have you looked into, I can't think of the name of the ship. Uh, it was off the coast of uh, New York, I believe, and um, they were doing some, supposedly, they were doing some experiments with vibration and frequency and stuff, and uh, there was an accident, and the military personnel and stuff were, like, inside the bulkheads. Montauk? You know what I'm talking about? Is that Montauk? <sighs> Montauk is the research facility out there. I'm trying to think of the name of the ship. I know. Oh, the ship. Okay. Yeah, it was a ship out, out in the ocean, mm. there, and they... It like I didn't hear about that. Disappeared in one location and then reappeared in like a, several hundred feet away or something. And I can't hmm. think of the name of the ship, but it's a <clears throat> it's an old I don't know, conspiracy thing, whatever. But um, Manhattan Project? No, that's not that. No, Manhattan, Manhattan Project was the atomic was part of the atomic <laughs> yeah. bomb. <laughs> I know what the, I know what the Manhattan Project was. I can't think of this one though. Um, hmm. Yeah, but you haven't you haven't heard of that, or you don't know what I'm talking about? Mm -mm. No, no. I, I mean that's wild. Uh, I met, yeah, I'm surprised I haven't heard about that. That's crazy. I wonder what they were doing out there. Supposedly like you said, frequency experiments and stuff. Yeah. Like um, yeah, I can't. Like I wonder, like in what I wonder what experiments they would have been doing. You know, because I mean, what if they were blasting certain frequencies into the ground like into the bottom of the ocean or something what if they were trying to the philadelphia experiment that's it. okay all right no i haven't heard of that one i'm gonna have to look at that because that's interesting mm -hmm. i'd be curious to see what they were doing for sure i bet there's some documents on wikileaks <laughs> i think there's a uh, declassified documents on it as well already 
I mean, this, yeah, this that's why it really happened. It was all, you know, documented and stuff, but so many. How long ago? Seen it and, like, when did you say this was? Like the 70s? It sounds about right, yeah. I mean, I would imagine it was. Eldridge. Oh, the USS Eldridge. See, I would imagine if they were doing some stuff like that, they probably would have been doing it around the same time as MK Ultra, the Manhattan Project, all the. Oh, what was the project? Um, what was the one project where they? Uh, I don't think because MK Ultra that was the LSD one, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Then there was the one where they. Um, dude, there was another one, but like that kind of those. That time frame, right? 1955. 1955. But really, it was like during the Cold War era, wasn't it? Like shortly after World, like between the end of World War II and like, right, and like Vietnam. Was it that time? It was like that was like a period of 30 years, though, I feel like. So that's when most of our, you know, science and everything takes a leap is during the wartime because that's when all the money is going to science and discovering new things and, and all of that stuff. So it, it makes sense that, you know, a lot of our discoveries and research and stuff happened during that time. So. Well, and you know, as bad as it is, you know, as horrible as some of that stuff was. Okay. 1943. Shit. Lee was, so, was that before the, was that before world war two? I don't I don't know the exact dates of World War Two. I feel like it was like forty. I want to say it ended in the forties. I know it ended in the forties. I don't I just yeah. don't remember what it was it like forty five? I feel like it ended in forty five or forty four. Because then the Great Depression started after that. Or like Great Recession, right? Or whatever it was. Great. Oh, yeah. trying to hide from German subs. Okay. Um, so they were, they were trying to hide from the German subs by using this. Uh, 1939, the Second World War started. Right. And then it lasted how long? Like four years, three years? I mean, I know it wasn't like one and done. Hitler was taking over. <laughs> Hitler took over Europe before we everybody started stepping in. Like, nope. kind of like a like a fun game. We we make random comments on the show, and then our audience has to give us the answers. <laughs> it's like a trivia contest. No, I like that. I like that. It's no, awesome. um, Courtney says World yeah. War Two was second uh, six years. Oh yeah, so that went until the forty nineteen forty five. Yeah, but see, like right <laughs> after World War Two, she, she loves trivia. <laughs> I didn't think. Uh, like, I want to continue. Give me just a second. I need to go find my vape. I need some nicotine. You know, it's like sitting here shaking. <laughs> Guys, if you have any questions for us, uh, any questions for Austin, please put them in the comments section and uh, we will get to them here. Any questions about ITC or the paranormal or uh, working with Nick Croft's show, uh, just definitely put them in the comments and we will get to them here. <laughs> hey, Untold Radio Network fans. Want exclusive perks and to support our channel? Introducing our YouTube membership program with three amazing levels. Get loyalty badges that level up to different cryptids the longer you're a supporter. How cool is that? You'll also get access to custom Bigfoot emojis and priority in chat. Upgrade to Backstage Pass for exclusive wallpapers, photos, status updates, discounted books, and merchandise. Go all in with the producer level for everything mentioned plus member shoutouts. Ready for an enhanced experience? Join now, pick your membership level, and let's make this journey even more exciting together. All right, we are back. Guys, if you have any comments, like I said, get them in the section. Um, so you are also the uh, um, experiment and equipment person for Nick Roth's show. How's that going for you? I love it, man. I love it. But it's, it's uh, I actually get to do more experimentation. Like, that's where my real experimentation is. And I know that that seems you know, op, uh, like the opposite of what I should be doing, but, um, whew, 
Sorry, I ran out there. I was like, damn, I need to find this pen. <laughs> um, like, no, that's actually where my, like, the real experimentation goes because I actually get the freedom and the ability, you know, I get, like, we had a small budget as far as, like, you know, for the equipment. And so I was actually able to get some things that, you know, things that I had been wanting to try for so long, um, you know, just didn't have the money for or didn't think like I had other things I wanted to buy in priorities. But like this was actually a chance for me to really get, you know, really dive into some experimentation. So we did some crazy stuff. Um, and uh, towards the end of season three of Death Walker, I think is when I really started to get on like that. But um, Season four, I'm in 11 episodes. And so that's 11 out of 20 episodes. Nick has some kind of unique piece of equipment. I mean, that's the big thing is like anything that I give Nick, he's going to use on the show. Whether it's, you know, I mean, obviously he wants it to be a, something that's unique, different, right? Um, and uh, it, it's a lot more difficult than it seems right off the bat to like try to for every episode have something different hmm. well i mean that's cool but you know after the first like 20 25 episodes <laughs> it's like i'm starting to run out of things here man i need to keep going <laughs> so i i mean i love the fact that like while i'm on the show my soul my sole purpose for being on the show is to be able to provide Nick and Tessa with some kind of experiment or equipment. Now, I, I mean, I love the idea that it benefits. I mean, I don't really, I mean, I benefit from it, of course, but like I try to give that, give opportunities to other builders too, you know, like all the people that uh, reach out to me, you know, I, uh, if they have something, you know, unique, I'm always open to it, but, uh, I'm sorry, man. I'm like a lot more winded. <laughs> man. I mean, okay. So I, I've been able to use the opportunity to give other opportunities to people, you know, uh, be able to get all kinds of things on the show. Um, because I think it's really an opportunity for us to put different ideas out there on a bigger scale with a guy like Nick Groff, right? I mean, I think that, I mean, it's, it's an opportunity, I believe, to help bring ideas, like put these ideas out there. And hopefully somebody will watch the show and be like, oh, that's a cool idea. I wonder if I can do it with this and do it this way. Like, I want that. Like, I want people to experiment. And so I don't like, I'm going to be honest. I have my, most of the experiments may not even work. We might not have gotten any results. Honestly, I don't, I would not know because I'm not typically out there with, with Nick when he's, when him and Justin are doing the filming. Uh, typically I stayed on a base camp because I'm just there in case something with the equipment goes wrong. Right. <laughs> um, but I mean, it's an awesome opportunity, man. And I, I, appreciate every moment and the chance that Nick and Dan class gave me um, and their belief in me, you know, that's, it's awesome too. But uh, I think I, I just love the idea of being able to put these experiments out there, whether they work or not. Like it's just different paths that people can, I'm hoping people will see and then go and take it further, you know, go for it. Uh, you know, go forward with certain things that maybe I didn't have the time or the ability to do. Um, you know, I think because there are a lot of people that are smarter than me. I mean, and you're smarter than me in certain aspects. I'm smarter than you in different in other aspects, right? So, I mean, maybe you could see something that I'm doing and from an outside perspective, you could look at it and be like, oh, you know, I think that this might work a little better with it, right? Um, like stuff like that. I think that it's important for the field, right? it's very, very important for people to be able to see these things in advance. That's always the mission, man. It's advancing the field and inspiring people to like more people we have looking into these ideas, man. 
that's how we do it. Absolutely. And on that note, I want to ask you, you know, we talked about um, putting this in front of, of science and, and making it, you know, to, to prove or, or get the evidence here. What do you think that needs to happen in this field? What do you, you want to see happen from all the people that are out there doing these ghost hunts and investigation? What kind of documenting or how do we, how do we take this from a pseudoscience into a, a scientific realm? What, what do we need to do? Data. Data. Data, 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 data. That's all that you're going to need. I mean, the vi video and the problem I think with most people is that, you know, they capture a piece of evidence on one, you know, whether that be a camera, audio, whatever, and then they'll present that as the evidence. Some of them can be very, very interesting. Most of them are not. But, you know, we blame other people for the, for the way the community looks instead of how. You know, I mean, I don't, we blame certain, you know, like content creators, you know, I don't know. I, and that's a whole other conversation, but um, being data is going to be huge. And I think corroborating data is going to be even more important. Like you have to be able, like, I think a big thing would be these locations, location owners that have the money. And I mean, I'm a manager of, a, of several locations. So like, I don't own them, but if I did own one, I would be having like probably 25 50 i don't know how many security cameras i would have there covering multiple angles of every freaking inch of that place uh you would want to have um like sensors like covering all aspects of the place and it has to be recording data non-stop and you have to be able to look through it and i mean it takes a lot of time a lot of um you know, really due diligence and making sure like you're checking between like what would be the controlled environment versus introducing a, a variable, uh, like an outside variable and stuff like that. I mean, really experimenting with how the environment interacts with the at with uh, the changes in the environment, like how the building reacts in, with the changes in the environment inside. And most of the time, you assume like old buildings, they will react with the environment accordingly. Like that's why old buildings creep, and that's why houses, are, you know, but you know it contracts and expands, right? Um, and so, like we we assume that a lot of that could be paranormal, but um, you know if but if there's a normal baseline, we have to have a normal baseline, and we have to be able to do it and observe it from a um, an unbiased uh, view like but the data is gonna be so damn important because you have to be able to show every time these weird anomalies happen these are the kinds of like I don't know if anybody that watches the secrets of Skinwalker Ranch like that that right there is an example that is a perfect example of how things need to be done. Granted, they have all the fucking money in the world because Brandon Fugel, or what is it, Brandon Fugel or Fogel or Brandon Fugel Fugel. or whatever? Yeah, he, uh, I mean, dude's a billionaire. So, of course, I mean, like they can do whatever the hell they want. But, you know, that's how, that's the kind of approach that we need to take. You know, like that's why they shoot rockets up in the sky because they know it creates a reaction. Like we need to find out what creates a reaction and then how, so like my suggestion, like think about this, everybody says, you know, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that because this is what might happen. Right. Like granted Ouija boards specifically. And I don't know. I mean, I guess I look at Ouija boards as anything else. You know, if you use it, if you call to it, you call them, they will come. But I don't, I mean, people always talk about, oh, you should should not use a Ouija board. They like they're fearful of them. But my question always becomes, how many people have actually used a Ouija board and had a terrible experience? And when that stuff happened, how do we know that that was directly tied to the Ouija board versus, you know what I mean? So, uh, like, uh, I mean, like a stigma, I think, has a lot to do with it, but. I, you never hear a story of somebody uh, like every time I hear about Ouija boards, it's always, oh, my parents used one when they were a kid and they told me about this horrible experience. And, you know, it's like, but I've never actually like been a witness to it. So I don't know, you know, 
I don't know. I don't know, but so you, you got to have the data. If you have a Ouija board and you uh, are, you know, doing something with the Ouija board and in the background some bad thing happens, it doesn't necessarily mean that it was caused by the Ouija board, just the intent of the communication to begin with. So uh, and when you people will go into it with that mindset already, like they're fearful of what, you know, they've heard about the Ouija boards, but they've never actually witnessed that specific thing happening. I've, I mean, I know very few people that can sit there and tell me flat out that they used a Ouija board and they were terrified afterwards because they know for a fact that it was the Ouija board. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. I have very few people actually tell me that it's most people are just afraid to even touch them. So going back to your, your data in this, if you have this house set up or this building set up with all your, your sensors and equipment and stuff, mm -hmm. if you have a stimulus that, um, stimulates a response, uh, mm -hmm. and that is, you know, based on science that is um, repeatable. Does that become paranormal, or have you now just determined that that stimulus um, stimulates that response? Does that make well, sense? You know, it's funny. Every, yeah, yeah. No, you know what's funny is that everything back in the day, like let's imagine what even two hundred years ago. Or go back to Salem Witch Trials, man. Like everything is paranormal or supernatural of some sort until it's not. And so I think like that's and we'll we'll get to that point if we continue to go down the path in using the, the scientific approach. And I know that there's a lot of people out there that don't care, you know, about proving, you know, and that's okay. Everybody's in this field for their own reasons, but you know, if we're gonna talk about like proof or evidence, you know, is it like you really want to come and people want to talk about being a researcher, but it's like, we need to actually be doing research. And I don't even call myself a researcher. I'm more of an experiment or an experimentalist is what I call myself. Cause I just fucking play around with everything, see if anything works. And if it, and, you know, if people like the idea, I, I, you know, they can get it and then I can, hopefully they'll take some, you know, take it further or use it and get something with it. Um, but I mean, yeah, we need to see. I just feel like it's gonna be, uh, it's just gonna be, man. Like, it's just gonna be a lot of data, man. a lot of data that is gonna need to be um, corroborated. I'm trying to think, and I'm I'm sorry, I've kind of lost my train of thought here. I started. Uh, <laughs> Um, you, you are very passionate about this stuff and it, it shows. Oh me. yeah, dude. It's everything, everything, man. It's everything I live, man. Every, my, I sit like from the time I wake up to the time I go to bed, I'm sitting here at this desk trying to figure out new things to do, or I'm keeping up with orders or whatever. Um, you know, I'm trying to, I, I just started doing the laser trip wires. I just started doing, uh, well, I mean, I did those a while back, but I just revamped them and redid them again. You know, I'm always constantly busy between the builds, the locations. Um, you know, I hope that real researchers, real researchers will take the devices that are being put out there and being built um, and using them and experimenting and really like finding new ways to use them. And that's the cool part. That's the cool stuff is when people can find new ways to use existing devices. Absolutely. And you are so busy. I appreciate your time so much today. Um, speaking of being busy, where can people find you? Where are you going to be? Are you got any in-person events or any kind of cool stuff where people can come out and meet you and see your equipment and devices? Um, well, people can find me on Facebook. The UGPN is the Underground Paranormal Network Facebook page. Um, it's facebook.com slash the T-H-E-U-G-P-N. Um, or my Facebook page, I think it's Austin dot Maynard ten or something like that. I don't know. But you can find me. I'm pretty easy to find. Um, but as far as like in person stuff, I know that April twenty seventh, uh, they're doing a public event. Uh, my partners Mike Ring and Eric Moore and uh, Beth Gaff are doing a public event at Middle Point School in Middle Point, Ohio, on April twenty seventh. And I believe I may or may not be making an appearance down there. It just depends on 
how I feel, I guess. <laughs> if I got a whole bunch of stuff I got to do. Just we'll see. Um, but then I know that we're working on some other, I mean, the Memorial Day weekend, we're having that camp out at the village. Uh, that's a two day thing. I think it's Saturday and Sunday because Monday, Memorial Day, everybody should have off work, right? Um, most people, I guess. <laughs> um, but I'll be out there all weekend. Um, I mean, I, a lot of stuff just comes up, uh, you know, randomly, but anytime somebody wants to book, you know, the Brian jail or the former Williams County jail and father John's in Bryan, Ohio, you'll definitely see me there because I'm the one that covers those bookings. So, <laughs> sounds good. Where can people get them, the bookings? Uh, at the uh, Underground Paranormal Network Facebook page, actually. So, facebook.com slash the UGPN. T H E U G P N. Pretty sure that is in the show notes as well for anybody that's watching or listening. Uh, you can click in there. We got the links in there for you. So, if you forget it, uh, just go check it out. All right, man. Thank you right. so much for coming on. I appreciate it so much. And I, I look forward to seeing you all the, the cool stuff that you got coming out in uh, our future conversations. Yeah, man, absolutely. I appreciate you having me on, man. This was a fun conversation and hopefully we can do it again soon. Absolutely, man. Definitely talk to you later. All right. All right, guys, that is our show for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, thank you for uh, checking out Austin's work. And uh, again, the links are in the show notes. If you want to go check that out or book any of those locations that he was talking about or get some cool ITC equipment of your own from Austin. Coming up, guys, next week on the Paranormal Spectrum right here, same time, same place, we have Sky Chen will be joining us. He is a Reiki master and all kinds of cool medium and energy work, and uh, he is going to be here next week on the show. And if you are into the cryptid stuff coming up here on Monday... Uh, at noon central time, we have Alan McGardle is joining us to talk about Bigfoot and the UFO connection. So that is what we got coming up here on the Untold Radio Network with myself, Barnaby Jones. And uh, until next time, guys, I want to remind you that we are all part of the paranormal spectrum. See you next time. You seem to know something I don't.